From the outside, 1117 Morningside Avenue looked like a standard American home. White paneled and consisting of two stories, it was a cozy place for Billy Isom, Fretta Bostick, and Jesse Haney to call their own. But when they were all found dead inside one winter morning, the feeling of homeliness changed. As the police tried to discover the secrets it held within its walls, the structure seemed intimidating and foreboding, unable to shed light on one of Iowa's most grisly crimes. In today's episode, we'll be exploring this tragic mystery. On the morning of December 3rd, 1974, Harriet Isom drove across the town of Sioux City, Iowa, to her son's home at 1117 Morningside Avenue. 27-year-old Ernest Billy Isom Jr. hadn't been seen in two days, and neither had his housemate, 26-year-old Jesse Haney, or Billy's pregnant 24-year-old girlfriend, Fretta Bostick. The two men worked with Billy's father at Port Neal Station, but he had grown increasingly concerned by their absence and called Harriet from work, requesting that she stop in at the home. Accompanied by one of her neighbors, Harriet made the trip to Morningside Avenue. At the two-story house, she stepped inside to find it quiet and devoid of life. Making her way into the dining room, she discovered Fretta lying face down on the floor with her arms tucked beneath her body. She was barefoot, wearing a floral print dressing gown, and had been shot once in the back. Looking into the living room, Harriet discovered another body. Jesse was dressed, still wearing his winter jacket, propped up against the door to the hallway. He had been shot once in the back, and once behind the left ear. But for Harriet, the worst was yet to come. Billy lay undressed, face down on the floor, half on the mattress he and Fretta used as a bed. He had been shot twice in the back, and three times in the head. Upon discovering the bodies, Harriet and her neighbor ran from the house and hurried to a nearby phone box to contact law enforcement. Off-duty police officer Norman Cronick was the first to arrive, as he was the closest member of the police force to the Morningside Avenue residence. It wasn't long before detectives began to speculate about what may have happened to the young trio. Former Sioux City Police Chief Joe Frisbee, who spent time working as the lead investigator on the case, stated, when you have a situation like this, a thing in a house in the middle of the night, that narrows the field tremendously. The people that we were focusing on were people that they knew. There is no doubt in my mind, they knew the perpetrator. At the crime scene, investigators found no sign of forced entry. After scouring the area, they found nothing to be missing, and the home had not been ransacked, indicating that this was not a burglary gone wrong. Blood splatter implied that the killings had been carried out at a close range. The autopsies confirmed much of what police had already gathered from the scene. The trio's time of death was believed to have been within 24 hours of the discovery of the bodies, and the shots were likely fired as the group tried to flee from the gunman. The victim's two dogs were also discovered in the house. One was locked in a bathroom. Fortunately, they were unharmed, but they held no clues that could explain what had happened in the house the previous day. It was established that the victims had all been shot with a .380 caliber semi-automatic weapon, but going door to door, the police soon found that nobody had seen or heard anything suspicious. Just hours after the slayings became public knowledge, two men came forward with Billy's vehicle, a green 1974 Datsun, that had been missing from the driveway. The men claimed to be friends of the group and stated that they'd borrowed the car days beforehand, but they knew nothing of the crime that had been committed inside the home. Their story was believed by the authorities, who released them without charge. Rumors in town continued to swirl about what exactly had happened to the trio. Some speculated that Jesse brought home the culprit after a night of partying, others that a hit was ordered by drug dealers from Colorado or Montana. 
It was even suggested that the two men had created anti-union sentiments at the ports, and their co-workers had become disgruntled as a result. Meanwhile, investigators discovered that Jesse, Billy, and Fretta had only lived in Sioux City for a single month, and that their permanent addresses came from three different states. Jesse was born in Billings, Montana, in 1948, and spent much of his life in Red Lodge, 800 miles from Sioux City. From a young age, he dreamt of becoming an engineer, but his life derailed after a bad breakup, which resulted in him dropping out of school and serving briefly in the military. After his return, he purchased a home in Billings, which was reportedly meant to be a safe house for his friends, several of whom were involved in peddling drugs, but it eventually became a hideout for addicts and dealers, much to Jesse's dissatisfaction. He eventually left Montana and began taking work wherever he could find it, ultimately winding up in Colorado, where he befriended Ernest Isom Jr. and met a woman named Susan, who later became his girlfriend. Billy, for his part, was born in Hammond, Indiana in 1947. He was the only child of Harriet and Ernest Sr. and spent much of his early life moving around with his parents, something his father had to do for work. He served a brief stint in the military, but was wounded twice during his tours. When he returned from Vietnam, he began taking odd jobs and eventually met Fretta and Jesse. Little is known about Fretta's life, but she was born in 1950 in Greensboro, North Carolina, and was passionate about art. Investigators noted that Billy, Jesse, and Fretta had laid low for around six weeks before their appearance in Sioux City. They theorized that the trio had been in hiding before deciding to move to the city, hoping to blend in and go unnoticed. Because they were so new to the area, authorities struggled to find real friends of the trio. Nobody seemed to truly know them. The only person with a real connection to them was Jesse's girlfriend, Susan, who had moved back to Colorado about one week before the murders were carried out. She does not appear to have ever been a suspect, but some officers who worked on the case suspected that she knew more than she was letting on. Officer Russell White Jr., who spent time working on the case, later stated, They had found the woman, and she didn't know anything. I never believed that, and I still don't today. With little in the way of leads, detectives decided to attempt to piece together the trio's last movements to see if it would shed light on their case. It was established that Jesse and Billy had been missing from work for two days, but had been dead for about a day when their bodies were discovered. It was unclear why the pair had missed work the day before the shooting. The police reportedly received word that they may have quit their job due to the anti-union issues that were ongoing at work. Police Captain Frank O'Keefe noted that there had been some kind of walkout that the two men had taken part in, which was possibly why they didn't show up to work before their deaths. However, it is unclear if this is the real reason, as even Ernest Sr. didn't seem to know if the two were sick, striking, or absent for some other reason. On November 28th, the trio had dinner with Billy's parents. Two days later, on Saturday, November 30th, they went to a pub dubbed The Jet, where they met up with friends and had fun. That night, they invited their friends back to their home to continue the party. Nothing appears to have gone awry that night, other than that the house was apparently left in a mess. Fretter and Billy had planned to see Harriet and Ernest Sr. again the following day, on December 1st, but they never showed up. Later that same night, a friend of the group stopped by the home and knocked on the door, but received no answer. The friend shrugged it off and left the property, assuming the others were out or simply busy. Then, on December 2nd, the group's landlord stopped by to collect their rent for the month. However, he noticed that there were no footprints or tire tracks in the snow, and assumed the group had gone out of town for Thanksgiving and had not yet returned. Without knocking on the door or investigating further, he decided to leave the property and wait a few more days before trying again. Bizarrely, Investigators soon discovered that Harriet had not been the first one to set foot in the house since the murders had happened. On the morning of December 3rd, before she had turned up in search of her son, an IPS meter reader knocked at the door to the house. There was no response, so he let himself inside using the back door and headed straight for the basement. He told the police that on the way there, he noticed a woman lying on her side near the fireplace. He explained that he didn't look any further as he didn't want to intrude. He instead went downstairs, read the meters, and left. 
On December 4th, the day after the bodies were discovered, the police announced that they had taken a couple in for questioning in connection with the case. One half of the couple was a co-worker of Jesse's and Billy's and had quit his job on December 2nd, the same day the trio were shot. According to investigators, the man and his partner had left the Sioux City area with little to no notice in the small hours of the morning, about 10 hours before the bodies were found. The timing at which they left the city was highly suspect to investigators and seemed more sinister than a mere coincidence. The couple was apprehended on December 4th, just outside of Carlsbad, New Mexico. Investigators had asked authorities there to detain the couple as they were wanted for questioning in connection with the murders. Police Captain Frank O'Keefe claimed that they were not suspects, but they were friends of the victims and the police felt they should be questioned about their strange behavior. The couple were later identified as 25-year-old Van L. Chadwick and 18-year-old Diana Lindley, and they were questioned for much of December 5th, eventually being issued with polygraph tests, which they passed. As a result, they were released without charge. No concrete connection was ever made between Lindley and Chadwick, and the slayings of Fretter, Jesse, and Billy. Following their release, they were no longer considered persons of interest. Just weeks after the killings, it seemed that leads were running out. Police conducted hundreds of interviews across the nation, but still, the case was slowly coming to a halt, with one county attorney stating, we're still hoping something new will turn up. Law enforcement had no known motives, no witnesses, and no suspects. While they had an abundance of evidence, including bloody clothes, bullets, carpet pieces, and crime scene photographs, nothing much seemed to come from these items. In April of 1975, an individual was subpoenaed to testify in front of a grand jury about events connected to the deaths. However, it is unknown what came from this testimony, as nothing about it was ever made known to the public. That same month, the property at 1117 Morningside Avenue was torn down to make way for a car park. Authorities theorized early on that the murders were drug-related. Joe Frisbee stated that both men were shot very much in execution style. Ray Hanney, Jesse's brother, would later recall that when he last saw his sibling, he seemed exhausted and nervous, stating, he said they were after him. Reportedly, that same weekend, November 23rd, not long before his death, Jesse told a friend about a drug deal he was preparing to make. He planned to rip off the dealer, but never disclosed further details about the plan. All anyone seemed to know was that he would make a lot of money if he was able to pull it off. Ray added, he tried telling me what was going on, but he didn't tell me enough. In 1992, Ray told the Sioux City Journal, there isn't any question about it, it was a hit. Many members of Jesse's family believed that he had become deeply involved in the world of illegal narcotics and had become entangled with unsavory characters who didn't appreciate being messed around with. Officer Russell White Jr. noted that shortly before their deaths, the group had been partying with individuals who were involved with drug trafficking, adding, marijuana and traces of harder drugs had been found in the house. He also noted, it wasn't a crime of passion and robbery wasn't a motive. The only motivation we believed for the actual killing was that somebody wanted them dead. Over the course of the investigation, many detectives noted the cold-blooded, calm, and methodical way in which the slayings were carried out, leading to the idea that the perpetrator was hired to do the job. There is speculation that Freta was killed because she was a witness, as she was shot in the torso, not in the head, and was only shot once. However, Captain Lisa Clays has a different theory. Fretter interrupted a conversation Jesse and Billy were having with the killer, and this spooked him into firing his gun. She told the Sioux City Journal, she comes through the door, and that was the trigger. She spooked them, and I think this guy fired two times. The first one missed, the second one hit. If this is true, then Fretter would have been shot in the front instead of the back. Captain Clays added, this might give us a whole different picture of how this happened, which then might make us start looking at a whole different set of characters. Joe Frisbee also pointed out that the group seemed to be expecting some kind of backlash as they were known to leave the house armed, even carrying high caliber handguns in their lunchboxes. Jesse's 357 caliber revolver was discovered in a lunchbox inside his 1968 blue Chevrolet, which was still parked in the driveway. 
But it wasn't just drug dealing that might have caused the group trouble during their lifetime. Freta was reportedly involved with some credit card scams. Quote, they'd been using phony credit cards and were involved in buying and selling plastic. Investigators had also caught wind of an anonymous tip-off allegedly placed to a Sioux City TV station. The caller claimed that Jesse had testified in federal court in Denver against a major drug kingpin earlier in 1974. Both Billy and Fretta had previous arrests for narcotic possession. Billy had been charged with possession of marijuana in Kansas and spent a brief amount of time in prison, as had Fretta. After investigators returned from New Mexico, where they had been questioning Chadwick and Lindley, they received a telephone call from somebody who'd seen a news report of the murders on TV that evening and said they had information about the crime. According to Joe Frisbee, there were individuals in eastern Iowa that had witnessed the falling out of one of the victims with a person they were aiming to interview. He noted, there was some bad blood between them and this other group of people. The outcome of this lead is unknown, but evidently, whatever the police found out was not enough to bring the case to a close. Although law enforcement continued to investigate for several years after the deaths of Jesse, Billy, and Fressa, no closure ever came for their families. The investigation is still considered open today. Some of the officers who worked on the original case back in 1974 believe that it will one day be solved, though an article from the Sioux City Journal notes that Joe Frisbee has largely lost hope. The evidence collected from this case has, fortunately, been preserved and is still available to future investigators. Sadly, Billy's father passed away in 1987, while his mother died more recently in 2015. Similarly, Jesse's parents are both deceased, as is Fretta's mother. They never saw justice for their children. Captain Clays said of the case, to the living, we owe respect. To the dead, we owe the truth. There is always hope for justice in this or any unsolved case. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations. And remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.